Hello and welcome to Who Wore It Better, where I review Raw and SmackDown back to back and try and figure out which show won for the week. Well, let's begin right away with the uh, how Raw began on Monday. Roman Reigns shows up for the first time since October to address his leukemia status. He gets a big ovation, lots of Roman chants, which is very nice. He uh, has a lot of time to talk, as is his right, but the hook of the story is, the crux of everything is, his leukemia is in remission, so he has conquered leukemia once again, which gets a huge ovation. Uh, really cool news to hear. Glad to hear he is he's back on the mend. After his speech, Seth Rollins shows up. The two of them hug it out. Very touching moment. Not much else I can really say about this segment other than, you know, hey, it's nice to hear some good news for a change every once in a while. Uh, again, congratulations to Roman. It's, uh, it's great to hear that he's doing well. I think uh, the, there's, there's people out there who have conspiracy theories that this is all a big work. It's all just a really, you know, shameless ploy by WWE for the fans to get on Roman side, which I think, you know, that's very cynical at best and just classless at worst. I mean, I think the people who honestly believe that they're trying to, they're, they're trying to work you by, by saying, oh, Roman's got cancer. It is just, it's so, it's so beyond the pale to me. You know, there's a really great Twitter thread that was written by a group based out of the UK called Leukemia Care. It does a very good job like explaining and debunking a lot of the conspiracy theories out there. It's very educational and I recommend that if you haven't seen it and if you if you want some more reasons as to why the conspiracy theory is full of shit you should check that out i'm posting the link to that twitter thread in the description for this video our first match is the revival in a non-title match against alistair black and ricochet who are now just officially a tag team now by the mere virtue of them having come up from nxt together uh there's a really cool moment in the match where dawson does a nice little tribute to arn anderson where he goes back to pull a punch and then alistair ducks and uh dawson catches him with the ddt i love that spot but uh, Black hits Black Mass on Dawson to win the match for him and Ricochet. So two weeks in a row now where the Revival have lost. You know, non-title matches, but losing nonetheless just after having won the tag belts from Bobby Roode and Chad Gable. You know, it was an okay match, just a bad look for the Revival. It's one thing for them to lose to DIY last week because, you know, they're an established team and the two teams have history together, but it's another thing entirely when they lose to a team that just formed on that night. Backstage, Baron Corbin's being interviewed. He says he doesn't want to live in the past when being judged for his previous comments toward Roman Reigns when he first relinquished the Universal Championship back in October. He says that their paths better not cross, so ooh. Elias shows up and he is immediately interrupted by Lacey Evans, who says hello and goodbye. Then Elias is cut off again, this time by Dean Ambrose, who cuts a promo. He says he's challenging Drew McIntyre for a rematch later on in a no DQ match. And then, you know, they make a crack about uh, the Academy Awards the previous night. Dean says he wants to have some requests. And then Elias swings the guitar at him, but Dean ducks, hits Dirty Deeds, and walks off. And that's pretty much the end of the segment. Poor Elias. Poor, poor Elias. Ronda Rousey and Natalya take on Ruby Riot and Sarah Logan of the Riot Squad. At one point in the match, uh, Liv Morgan gets involved from the outside, but then uh, Ronda and Natalya gang up on her. They hit her with a version of the heart attack on the outside on the floor, and then after the commercial break, Liv is just fine, like nothing happened. Uh, Ronda hits the Piper's Pit on Logan when Becky Lynch makes her way through the crowd and through the barricade and everything. One of the security guards like tries to stop her legit, but then he's, he's, he's clued into the fact it's all part of the show. So, so, uh, Becky fights Natty, fights Rhonda, and uh, eventually the cops are called in. She's arrested for violating her suspension, and she's gone the whole rest of the night. Uh, you know, Rhonda's at her wit's end with all this chaos that Becky Lynch has started, so she calls out Vincent Mann to fix this. Stephanie comes out instead, and so we get this uh, this big conversation, this big uh, big confrontation, I guess, between Becky and, I should say, Rhonda and Stephanie, where Rhonda pleads with Stephanie to reinstate Becky so that we can get this over with and just have the match, but uh, Stephanie it says it's a hard no, and it's Becky's fault that all of this has happened. And so Rhonda, at one point, Rhonda calls Becky a ginger douche in the cuffs, which I thought was a very interesting uh, comment. Uh, she says to think of uh, Stephanie's daughters and her legacy. Stephanie still says no, no reinstatement. And so Rhonda gets mad, Stephanie gets mad, and then Rhonda says that by having Charlotte be the hand-picked contender, then the belt is nothing more than an accessory. She refuses to have it, so she puts the belt down, tells Stephanie to make the right decision, and leaves. So now it's she's seemingly uh, threatening to relinquish the championship out of protest for this, unless, you know, she, she's basically forcing the McMahon's hand in this. You know, it's a very interesting twist. I didn't see this one coming because, you know, it keeps Rhonda as like an active participant 
in this storyline because it feels like she's been kind of a third wheel the last couple of weeks because the conflict has all been about Becky and Charlotte, I feel. So um, keeping her in, and having her be the catalyst to this sort of thing, I think just makes the conflict between all three of the women mean a lot more. Jinder Mahal's mad that he's not invited to Ric Flair's 70th birthday party later tonight, and he says he will you know, challenge anyone who's been invited to the party to a match. Out comes Kurt Angle. Uh, Jinder's on top for a while in the match. He's pretty dominant, but Angle eventually wins with the ankle lock in a pretty short and sweet match. And then Angle, German suplexes, both the same brothers for good measure. After that, we transition right into Moment of Bliss with special guest IC champion Finn Balor. And Alexa is just swooning over Finn and his abs, much like the rest of the internet, basically. And she says, you know, if you show me your abs, I'll show you my. And before she can say anything, Leo Rush interrupts and Corey Graves is throwing an absolute fit over, uh, you know, Leo Rush interrupting this seemingly sexy moment. So Finn, uh, Leo, I should say, tells Finn that, you know, Bobby deserves to be the champion. He talks some more, and Finn basically twists Leo's words into saying, oh, you're saying you want a title match against me? Well, I accept. And Leo's totally kind of, like, confused and flustered by all this. Alexa eggs Leo on, and Finn goes, ooh, which just instantly kills his, cra kills his cool factor for me. So um, Leo says, okay, fine, we'll have the match. I'll get ready, and we'll come out later. And then Alexa says, says, no, that match is happening right now. How does she know that? Does she not? Does she doesn't have the power to do this? And so this, the whole segment ends in this very awkward note as they make their entrances for this match coming up. Why has this particular interview segment always been so consistently weird and bad? I thought Alexa was clear to wrestle again. Can we just get back to her wrestling full time? So now we have Finn Balor defending his Intercontinental Championship against Leo Rush in a rematch from their singles match a few weeks ago on Raw. And Leo looks good again against Finn here, working the leg for the most part. Finn makes his comeback. He hits 19-16 on Leo, then the coup de grace to win and retain the championship. But backstage, we go to Tucker Knight, who's walking through the locker room, and he He's confronted by the Ascension, and right away my first thought is, wow, either Tucker is a lot shorter than I thought he was, or Victor is a lot taller than I thought he was. So then, because <laughs> they're like right up against each other, but that does not look right. So the Ascension are mocking Otis Dozovich, who is not there at the moment, and then Otis literally just teleports into the shot. Like the way the, the narrowness of the hallway and his position where he was on camera made it look like he just came to the wall or something. Like, where did he come from? So Tucker relays all this information to Otis, and then Otis just like clocks both members of the Ascension and knocks them down. So probably going to get a follow-up with these two uh, these two teams in a match next week on Raw. In the gorilla position, Lashley is chastising Leo Rush for what happened earlier against Finn Balor, saying that title shot was supposed to be for me. And he, he wants to make sure he can trust Leo Rush. And then as they have that confrontation, Lashley's music plays and goes in the next match. It's uh, Lashley versus Braun Strowman. Strowman comes out. They just fight on the outside the whole time. Uh, Strowman pretty much takes out Lashley and Rush single-handedly. Match never really gets underway. Braun stands tall. Okie doke. A pretty basic promo backstage from Seth Rollins where he says, you know, he promises to win the championship at WrestleMania. He's happy that Roman's in remission and he's going to have a drink with him. Up next, no DQ match as Dean Ambrose takes on Drew McIntyre, much like the Ruby Riot Ronda Rousey rematch from last Raw. Why would I be interested in this matchup when the previous one was so uh, underwhelming and one-sided? Uh, Dean two belts Ambrose. At one point, he takes off his belt to whip Drew with it, and he's got another belt on underneath. Like, why does he have two belts? That that confused me the whole rest of the night. But Ambrose just whips the shit out of uh, Drew in his big comeback near the end. Then out comes Elias, a bit of a receipt from what happened earlier. He jumps Ambrose. Drew hits Dean with the Claymore to win once again. Then out come Lashley and Baron Corbin. Uh, so all the heels are beating down Ambrose. Seth Rollins shows up with a chair. Roman Reigns comes right afterward. And those two clean house. And they tease what would be the third Shield reunion in three years with Ambrose. But nothing happens just yet. But you can bet your bottom dollar that's going to be happening again before WrestleMania. Nia Jax versus Bailey in singles action. One of my favorite parts of the match is actually during Nia's entrance when she and Tamina beat up one of the Bailey buddies as they make their entrance. It's actually a really nice match. I think for the most part, these two work really well together. They have kind of like an underrated chemistry because Nia Jax is all about the size and the strength versus Bailey's like, you know, resiliency and her fiery comeback and everything. So it's a really good match here. Nia grabs like Sasha's hair on the outside, Bailey with a big hit. Uh, 
Sasha dodges Tamina on the outside. Bailey with a big elbow drop to beat Nia Jax. So like I said, this is a pretty good one and uh, more heat for the two teams going into fast lane for the uh, tag title defense. We close out Raw with Ric Flair's 70th birthday celebration. All night we've been seeing uh, special messages from guests like Snoop Dogg and Stone Cold Steve Austin and everything. The whole dang roster is up on the stage. It's really weird seeing Tommaso Ciampa just sitting there like smiling, looking happy to be there. Also, is it odd that like everyone's on the stage and all the business is happening like in the ring? Doesn't seem like much of a party when like the whole thing is segregated. So Triple H and Stephanie, they, they introduce Shawn Michaels, Ricky Steamboat, who chops a bunch of guys on his way out, which is pretty funny. Uh, Kurt Angle, Sting, really cool to see Sting here. Uh, he has kind of a, a, a moment with Bobby Roode, former TNA rival, as he makes his way to the ring. So yeah, they show a great tribute package to Flair and all his accomplishments. They present a custom world championship belt with like with custom side plates that have like all of his like, world title wins and who he beat in what year. Really cool. And so they introduce Ric Flair, but he doesn't show up. And all of a sudden it cuts backstage and you see Batista dragging a cameraman to Ric Flair's dressing room. And he barges in there. He comes out with Flair. He's dragging like a lifeless Flair across the floor and everything. And like it's so like just like shocking. Like what, who, who could have expected this to happen? So he drops Flair and he gets looks at the camera and says, you know, Triple H, do I have your attention now? And then every, Triple H and Stephanie run to the back and they're, they're, they're trying to console this like beaten down, half dead Ric Flair and the show fades to black. You know, I mean, I did not see this coming at all. I think a lot of us kind of expected that, oh, Becky Lynch is going to find somebody to crash the party. Like, Charlotte's going to be cutting some self-aggrandizing speech. Becky's going to find some way to escape a police custody or post bail. She's going to, you know, put Ric Flair in the figure four leg lock or something, maybe chop him or something. You know, haha, whatever. This is going to be how she gets, you know, more heat on Charlotte. But, like, this is a totally different scenario that I don't think anyone really could have expected. Such a curveball for me. And really, one of the most shocking ends to Raw, I, I can't remember the last time I saw an ending that was like, whoa, this really caught me off guard in a, in a really good way. Uh, you know, I, I just kind of assumed that Batista Triple H for WrestleMania was off, but man, Triple H heals pretty darn quick, doesn't he? It's a contract signing. SmackDown begins by making the Kofi Kingston Daniel Bryan match for Fastlane official. Shane McMahon, before Kofi comes out, Shane describes Kofi as an overnight success over the last 11 years. I don't know if he meant it for it to sound funny like that, but they recap some of his biggest career highlights over the last 11 years. Kofi and the New Day come out. Kofi makes a speech and says he's going to beat Daniel Bryan. Kofi's about to sign when Mr. McMahon appears. And basically he comes out and he says he's replacing Kofi Kingston with someone who's more qualified in Kevin Owens. So now Kevin is officially back on TV on SmackDown now. And uh, so yeah, he sports some new ink on his arm. He signs a contract and Kofi is just kind of like reserved and beside himself while Xavier and Big E are just like, what the, what's going on? This is a travesty, a miscarriage of justice. It was a big twist and it's cool to see Kevin Owens back on TV, but I do have some reservations and some questions about this, this new wrinkle. Because first of all, Mr. McMahon must be very forgiving to allow this man who beat the hell out of him uh, a couple of years ago on SmackDown, just give him a championship match right off the bat in his return. You know, second of all, the logic of why Vince is doing this doesn't make sense because he says in his promo, I have to make the biggest match possible, the biggest box office attractions and Kofi you're not it but Kevin Owens is you know Kevin Owens credibility and his box office value aside Kofi Kingston is part of the most popular stable in the company and they move a shit ton of merch how is Kofi by that definition not a huge box office attraction potential against Daniel Bryan that to me makes absolutely no sense also it just seems like they're just trying to replicate the exact same thing they're doing with Charlotte and Becky and Ronda for the women's championship with this. Like the face and heel dynamics a bit different between the women and the men because Kevin Owens right now is still playing babyface, but it's just, it's just so weird. Like why would you have this very carbon copy-esque thing going on with the WWE Championship as you're doing with the Raw one. And it's brought about the same exact way where Mr. McMahon, evil owner, brings in his hand-picked replacement. Like, it's the exact same thing. And that to me it just makes no sense. Our first match sees the Bar versus the Hardy Boys. That's right, folks. You heard me. Jeff and Matt together again. Matt is there. He's back from several months off due to injury. He's no longer broken or woken or whatever. He's looking real cut. He's lost a lot of weight. He's looking really, really in good shape here. 
there. Uh, you know, the shot value of Matt coming back and the Hardy boys reuniting aside, it's a decent match. Hardy's win after the twist of fate or, and the Swanton onto Sheamus. And uh, there you go. So, yeah, Matt coming back, I did not expect that. I, I you know, I think it's like I, when he left, I kind of assumed he was basically retiring, even though he then said on social media a while ago that he was not retiring, but never knew when he was going to come back. But now he seems to be okay. One thing I noticed, though, is that he didn't do, I don't think he did any leg drops in this one. He, uh, he did a, an elbow drop off the second rope instead of what he would normally do a leg drop. So you can see maybe he's kind of changing his style just a little bit. But great to see Matt Hardy back. Backstage, Ricochet and Aleister Black are looking on the monitor watching what just happened with the Hardy Boys when suddenly Lana shows up and she might as well be Jerry Seinfeld because she just can't see what's the big deal with Ricochet and Aleister Black. They announced the Honky Tonk Man's going to the Hall of Fame this year, which is some pretty cool news. I, like Hillbilly Jim last year, I think Honky's one of those guys where like you just kind of assumed he was already in the Hall of Fame. But then I remember like, oh no, no, he wasn't inducted already. He like inducted, I think, Ted DiBiase a few years ago. So like that was his involvement. I guess, I guess he's been done talking shit about the company long enough that they said, okay, we'll put you in the Hall of Fame now. So good for him, you know? But I mean, like, he is definitely, you know, he was... Uh, you know, he still holds the record for the longest single IC title reign in history. Uh, such a memorable character, a memorable like heel. The stuff with Jimmy Hart back in the day was like so good, uh, and you just wanted to see him get beat up. So I think he was just a, a really great, memorable character from the '80s. And yeah, long overdue. Like he's part of like that tapestry of the WWF during that golden era. So I think he absolutely belongs to get in the Hall of Fame. For weeks, the U.S. Champion R Truth has seemingly been missing on SmackDown Live, but he, he's alive and well. It turns out he shows up here on Tuesday. He issues an open challenge for the championship. Andrade comes out first, but then Rey Mysterio just runs past him into the ring and so truth decides what would John Cena do at a time like this he's gonna fight both of them at once it's a good it's, it's, a, it's a good snappy match here Andrade power bombs truth onto the floor which just did not look good uh, like pretty wild spots as well at one point Ray jumps at the top rope Andrade's on truth's shoulders and Ray does a hurricane Rana onto Andrade and he comes flying off of truth's shoulders really cool spot so truth pulls out a win though because Ray hits a 619 on Andrade and then truth rolls him right up afterwards so truth is able to retain Ray and Andrade have a bit of a scuffle afterward and that feud is definitely far from over so nice to see our truth back on tv for a change uh but yeah after oscar lost you know kind of a semi-related note oscar after having lost last week after being gone the previous three weeks, is nowhere to be found on Tuesday. Charlotte Flair is in Charlotte to cut a promo to talk about what happened on Monday with Becky and Ronda. She says that Becky and Ronda fear her and that a true champion fears no one. She says she's going to show up on Raw on Monday so Mr. McMahon can award her the Raw Women's Championship. I'm pretty sure something's going to throw a wrench in those plans for Charlotte. Uh, it's a good heel promo, but my biggest thing was, how in the hell did she not mention once at all what happened on Monday with her own father and how he was like beaten half to death by Batista. Like, I'm not saying she needs to cut an entire soliloquy about what happened, but just some kind of acknowledgement about it. It just seems so weird that, you know, there's no, there's such a disconnect between what happened on Raw and what happened on SmackDown with Charlotte just being all smiles and woo, I'm the queen and all that stuff. Like, where's the continuity? Where's the quality control? That just pissed me off to no end. Ricochet and Aleister Black team up once again this week to take on Naka Musev. So Shinsuke and Rusev are still at odds with each other, apparently according to what they say on commentary, but they are still kind of a reluctant tag team. And so they're just kind of like uh, working out the kinks right now. It's a pretty good match. Black hits Shinsuke with Black Mask to win once again. So the NXT guys still undefeated on television the last couple of weeks on the main roster. We saw a bit of uh, Champa and Gargano on Monday in some kind of like on the sidelines, basically for the Ric Flair party and everything. But I'm wondering uh, why didn't these guys wrestle this week? AJ Styles being interviewed backstage. He says he hasn't been his best lately. He says he's going to work hard hard and, and get back on top of the mountain, the house that AJ Styles built and all that. And Randy Orton shows up and just says, the house that AJ Styles, what? And then he leaves. Then, hello, Lacey Evans. Goodbye, Lacey Evans. So earlier in the night, Kevin Owens requested this match, and it's your main event as he and Kofi Kingston team up to take on Daniel Bryan and Rowan. It's Kevin's first match back on television after being taken off months ago, uh, being laid up by Bobby Lashley, getting that double knee surgery. Uh, you know, it's, it, he's in an interesting spot, is Kevin Owens, because he got this hero's welcome uh, for, being for being announced by Mr. McMahon. Even though he is replacing the uh, universally beloved underdog, babyface, and Kofi 
Eddie Kingston. He has not been booed yet by the audience, which is good, I think. You know, he's still kind of playing, I think, tweener, because like he wasn't full on babyface in his wrestling match on Tuesday. Wasn't playing heel either. I think he's pretty, pretty, straight, pretty straight right now. So uh, Kofi and Kevin win when Kevin hits the stunner on Daniel Bryan. So they have a bit of a kind of a face off at the end of Kevin and Kofi. Kofi looks like kind of sad, and Kofi and Kevin's trying to stay respectful and everything as we fade to black. You know, I just feel it's, it's inevitable that Kevin's going to turn at some point, uh, turn heel. I'm thinking after fast lane, uh, but we'll see what happens with that. I think it also kind of telegraphs that maybe Kofi's going to win the championship at Mania or at least get his one on one match. Time now for me to decide which show won for the week, Raw or SmackDown. And this week, I have to give the nod to Raw. You know, I think SmackDown put up a hell of a fight, but there was just way too much huge stuff happening on Raw for me to deny it. You know, seeing Roman come back was great. Very heartwarming stuff. Very uplifting to see Roman come back and announce his cancers in remission. Uh, the stuff involving the women's title was very interesting. The ending angle with Flair and Batista just almost knocked me on my ass. How much of a shocker it was. It just kind of came out of nowhere, really. Uh, you know, on SmackDown, except for Kevin Owens coming back, which is great, nothing else on SmackDown really made me go, oh boy, the landscape's changing. Like, the Hardys coming back was really cool, but like, you know, what's the plan with that? Like, really, nothing really shocked me besides Kevin Owens coming back. And to a lesser extent, Matt Hardy too, but it's like, you know, I mean, that one I'm just kind of like, okay, for the, for the 800th time, the Hardys are reunited. So what happens next? Well, let me know what you thought about Raw and SmackDown this week in the comments section below. And be sure to vote which show you thought was better in the gimmick in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it. Subscribe to Wrestling With Regret. Buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. And check out Patreon.com slash Wrestling With Regret for exclusive perks and bonus content. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.